Uh, so good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning about healthy aging and hearing. But in the spirit of equal opportunity, after last the last presentation, uh, which seemed to in, uh, state that women were more at risk, uh, in today's talk about hearing loss, men are more at risk. <laughs> so, why is hearing so important? It's uh, it. Um, it provides us with our humanity, and it's really crucial for communication and social interactions. And also importantly, as we age, uh, to listen to music. Music appreciation without hearing is not possible. And so <clears throat> hearing also warns us of those dangers that we don't see. So. If we want to understand hearing and the brain and hearing loss, we need to first understand a little bit about sound. So sound is simply vibrations in air. So if you take a tuning fork and you bang it, it moves back and forth. And what happens is when it goes in one direction, it compresses air. When it goes in the other direction, it rarefies air. And pairs of compression and rarefaction gives us a cycle. And the a cycle is Hertz, called Hertz, and so the number of cycles per second uh, gives us frequency, and frequency gives us the sensation of whether the sound has a high pitch, like a squeak, or a low pitch, like a rumble. And so on the bottom is uh, just a diagram of a piano keyboard. The uh, cyan uh, note is middle C, which is 256 cycles per second. And the highest note on a piano is 4,186 cycles per second, and the lowest note is 27 cycles per second. So this is a, a pretty limited range of what we hear, but it gives us an example of our hearing range, what we use mostly. Now we can hear, well, when we were 10, and before we exposed ourselves to industrial noise, we could hear to 20,000 cycles per second. Most of us, probably in this room, it's much less. The, um, the onslaught of living in an industrialized society exposes us to noise, and so uh, we lose our hearing range. And so all sounds are composed of different frequencies. Okay, so different sounds have different frequencies. And uh, speech, for instance, is just a series of sounds uh, s said in sort of a sequence. And in analogy to how rain separates light into the rainbow of colors, the ear, the inner ear, separates sounds into its composite frequencies. So frequency is really important. And so that is sort of the foundation of much of how we communicate. So what we have here are four spectrograms. So on this axis, on the uh, vertical axis, is frequency. And on the horizontal axis is time. And so these are the vowel sounds, like ah for hot, ah for hat, i for hit, e for head. And you can see that most of this energy is between 1 and 4,000 cycles per second. And the change occurs in this range between 1 and 2,000 cycles per second. So if we have hearing loss in that range, we're not going to be able to understand certain vowel sounds. And this will be especially confounded in a noisy environment. And so this just goes to show that frequency, very subtle differences in frequency, changes the way we hear words. And so people, one of the ways we know that someone speaks with a foreign accent is because the pronunciation of the frequencies or the vowel sounds are slightly different and the timing of how they pronounce and state the sentences will be slightly different. So in addition to frequency, loudness is a major component of sound. And so loudness is simply the pressure of the airways as it strikes the eardrum or the measuring device. And we have an incredible range of hearing from the softest whisper to a jet engine. It's like seven orders of magnitude. So if our hearing was any better, we'd be hearing Brownian motion, that is the air molecules vibrating near our, our tympanic membrane. 
Loud noises are the bane of industrialized society. Okay, so loud noise is what injures our ears, injures our ear. Uh, loud noise is like radiation or ultraviolet light. A little bit is okay, a lot is bad, and it's a cumulative exposure to loud noise is what damages our hearing. The other, the third component of hearing is timing. Okay, it's like we know timing because sound has an onset, it has an offset, it has a duration, um, and it has patterns. So there's rhythm to sound that we use. It's very important. It's important in melodies, and it's and in melodies it's also important to what we call prosody, which is the cadence of speech, and it's in pronunciation. Okay, so different pronunciation, different words. Pronunci different. <laughs> so, hearing loss itself is not what's crucial. It's the symptoms of hearing loss. Okay, so if it's just hearing loss, we can amplify the, the sound and we do better. But the symptoms of hearing loss are difficult in understanding speech and noise, the appearance or the emergence of phantom sounds like tinnitus or ringing of the ears, and distortions of loudness, also called hyperacusis, where small changes in volume can cause a painful sensation. So our lab looks at these symptoms, and we're trying to study those brain changes that cause the symptoms, because like I said, it's the hearing loss itself is not the problem. It's the brain changes that occur as a consequence of hearing loss that create the symptoms that are so annoying. <clears throat> so in order to do this, we need to follow the path of sound to see where the danger lies and what is being affected in the brain. So this is pretty common. We know that the pinna is like a funnel. It collects the sound in the air, brings it into the tympanic membrane through the ear canal. The vibrations of the uh, tympanic membrane and the middle ear bones convey the vibrations in air to vibrations in the inner ear. If we pick off the bone around the inner ear, we see the inner workings of the cochlea or the ear. And what we can see is this membrane. It's a flexible membrane that spirals with the ear. And on top of this flexible membrane are the sensory receptors. And in this little box, I have outlined the, sensory, the tips of their sensory receptors as they sit. And so when vibrations come in, the, high, the low frequencies vibrate up here, the middle frequencies vibrate here, and the high frequencies vibrate towards the base. And so if we look at a normal hearing ear, it's, you have really nice intact rows of the hair cells, the sensory receptors, about 4,000 in each row. Okay. But with hearing loss, you can see the hair cells are damaged. And this is damaged by excessive exposure to noise. Okay. So what happens in this instance? Okay. It's like in this top view, we have a high density of auditory nerve fibers carrying the information from the central receptors into the brain. And it gives us sort of a high definition audio environment. It's, a, it's sort of equivalent to this high definition image of the opera house. Okay, so normally with normal hearing we hear lots of details and it's like a high definition image where you see the opera house but you also see the people around it. You see Bradley's head in the background. With hearing loss you have reduced information coming into the ear and it's, this reduced information gives us What's analogous to a pixelated acoustic environment. So now you can see the, the, or the uh, sort of iconic um, opera house you recognize, but you don't see any of the details. And so the thing about hearing loss is you can recognize the words that are very common that you're well aware of, but it becomes more difficult to decipher words that are new. So if you're having a conversation and a new word pops up or a word, a word that shows up that you're not so familiar with, you might not get it. And so 
this is an example, just a sort of an illustration of the auditory nerve fibers as it comes into the brain, that it innervates, and you can see it's pretty organized, and, and it's, the density is good, and it goes from low to high frequency, and that's shown in this color-coded graphic, where low frequencies are in blues, and you go progressively to the high frequencies in red. So the whole brain is organized, at least the auditory portion of the brain, is organized by frequency. With hearing loss, okay, again, we have that. And if we look at a hearing loss case, we can see that the innervation, as we know, is less dense, but it's also a little bit more meandering. The precision of the projections aren't quite as good as they were with normal hearing. And that is sort of like you'd strike a, if you strike a piano, C, but the piano plays C, uh, E sharp or something, okay? So it confuses the brain. The brain will have a harder time understanding speech when this process is in place. The other thing that happens is at the tips of these endings, that these auditory nerve fibers are these large endings. These are the endings that are specialized to transmit information from the nerve fiber to the brain cell. And these transfers are important because it links neural events to acoustic events. Okay, so we know how important it is as you're watching a movie, if the sound audio is out of sync with the movement of the lips, it's difficult to watch and listen. So it's, oops, it's these, these endings that make the transfer of information really precise, but they atrophy with hearing loss. And what this means is they're less efficient in transferring the information. So there may be some hesitancy, there may be, some, there may be transmission failure. It just introduces jitter to the whole process. And so this means that, that speech gets smeared out over time, at least the reception part. And the thing, that, the thing that's pretty interesting about speech is it's really fast, all right? So we English speakers, we listen to a foreign language and all we can do is complain, God, they speak quickly, okay? Now, it really doesn't matter what other language it is, language goes quickly. And the miracle is that the brain processes these signals very quickly. And so as someone who has studied, but not necessarily succeeded at learning foreign languages, every foreign language I've studied, they go really fast, except Latin, because Latin is a dead one. You know, you just, you just read it. So frequency, important. Timing, important. But the brain circuits aren't just set to transmit Ex excitation, okay, or to alert, alert us to things that are going on in, in our acoustic environment. Here we have tissue that's been stained for an inhibitory chemical. And so the green stains glycine, and glycine is a chemical that shuts down the activity of this cell. With hearing loss, these inhibitory circuits have gone away. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the cell has been released from its brakes. So it can be active even in the absence of sound. Okay, what does that mean? That's tinnitus, that's the emergence of phantom sounds, the clanging of our ears, things that aren't there. That's because the brain doesn't like a vacuum. And it doesn't like a vacuum because the brakes have been removed. And so when you get this release of inhibition, you start to hear things. So what have, what have we done? We've, we've, we've studied sort of hearing loss per se. I've gone over the fact that there are brain changes consequent to hearing loss, and those are changes in frequency organization, which impairs our ability to understand vowel sounds especially, but speech in general. There is changes in timing, so that impairs our ability to localize sound sources or to follow speech in the nor normal cadence. And then there's this loss of inhibition, which results in the, the emergence of phantom sounds. So these are the problems we face with hearing loss. And it's not just that we, uh, 
uh, we can't understand speech anymore. We can't go to the, we can't go and party. We have trouble in noisy restaurants. But it puts us at risk for other things. It, it really puts us at risk for social isolation, okay? Because if you can't go to a party and understand what's going on, why bother? So I have friends who just don't go to parties. They just stay at home, okay? It puts you at risk for depression, because if you're lonely, you don't go places, you sit at home. And you're five times at risk, if, if, if your hearing loss is untreated, for cognitive decline. So the long-term effects of hearing loss isn't just kind of the personal cost of, of so, social isolation, but it's a, it's a sort of a community cost because it's also expensive to, to have to put your family or put members of your family into a nursing home because it can no longer process the world. And it's caused by, or can be caused by, this hearing loss. And so for most of us, it is room our ship has sailed. We have our hearing based on our past history. But it's not too late for us to warn our children or our grandkids the importance of avoiding uh, traumatic noise. And, and so the point of all this is as we age, we don't want to end up spending our golden years uh, sort of in social isolation. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.